Yesterday I had a talk called The Common Law in Real Time. Uh, and last night I decided uh, I didn't want to speak exactly on that. I'm going to speak mainly on that um, for reasons which I'm not uh, quite sure uh, I can articulate, except to say that um, this consists of this talk that I am going to give and the talk that I would have given both consist of a lot of ideas which are in very preliminary form. And as such, um, uh, I hope that uh, they really make sense. Uh, I did a lot of work in law and economics up until about the mid-80s. Uh, uh, and then I got a little bored with it. Uh, but now I think I uh, would like to uh, come back to this area, because I think there's a lot of there are a lot of important things that can be said from an Austrian perspective, uh, or at least my Austrian perspective, uh, on issues of law and economics, and I would like to be able to do that. So let me start out by uh, saying that I view the common law, or the common law system, to be more pre precise, as a creative tension between order on the one hand and disorder on the other. Uh, I think it's a mistake to try to understand the common law in terms of ordering or self-ordering properties alone. Um, now, what do we mean by order or ordering properties? Um, of course, we could get into a lot of trouble here by trying to set out a precise definition. So I will skirt the issue slightly by uh, reading to you what Hayek says uh, the word order means in law, legislation, and liberty, and uh, more or less endorse what Hayek uh, says, unless you show me that the definition uh, doesn't really hold and uh, it's not very useful, in which case I'll retreat. Um, in any event, Hayek says in Law, Legislation, and Liberty, the first volume, that order is a state of affairs in which the elements are so related to each other that we may learn from our acquaintance with some part of the whole to form correct expectations concerning the rest, or at least expectations which have a good chance of proving correct. What Hayek exhibits here is his lifelong concern with the coordination of individual activities. And what he's saying, in effect, uh, when he says that uh, the common law uh, creates an order or has ordering properties, is that the com common law makes it easier for people to coordinate uh, their decisions uh, than it would be the case in the absence of uh, those common law rules. So we can also look at this uh, tension that I talked about, the tension between order and disorder, as a, t a tension between equilibrating and disequilibrating properties of the common law system. So going back to the original quotation uh, by Hayek, when he says uh, expectating expectations concerning the rest, what he really means, or what he can be interpreted as meaning, is expectations concerning the plans of other economic or legal agents. So the idea then is that in an, in an order or an orderly uh, society or an orderly framework, people's expectations about what other people will do have a good chance of proving uh, correct. Now a good chance of producing, uh, pro uh, uh, proving correct is not the most rigorous way to state it, uh, but on the other hand I think we'll see that uh, it, it, it would be quite difficult to state this in a rigorous way. Um, <clears throat> okay. So the common law, I will assert now and, and, and show you hopefully as I go along, embodies plan coordinating tendencies but also plan discoordinating tendencies. Uh, within a legal system, this order and disorder actually complement each other rather than are in conflict with each other. But it obviously raises a puzzling question, at least prima facie. How can such a thing uh, as a system in which there are ordering and disordering forces be coherent? And in what sense is it a system if it has both of these forces? I guess the uh, solution or the, uh, the preliminary answer to the question is to look at the common law system as a process uh, generating emergent properties, not as a process whose function it is to um, uh, 
come to some uh, um, end or produce some end that is knowable uh, if the, without, outside of the process. As Hayek says about competition, a competition is valuable mainly because it produces information that would not be available without it, not because it is a system whereby certain relationships or certain uh, uh, information is, that is known to observers or the economists are somehow transmitted uh, to the economic agents, but actually is a system whereby discoveries are made. In the same way, I think, the legal system uh, generates uh, discoveries and emergent properties. The whole question of the knowledge problem uh, that Yvonne brought up earlier uh, in the context of legal institutions is something which I've uh, thought about a lot and, uh, and, and, and talked about in the early 80s. And I think that um, uh, this is, I think, the, the crucial or critical problem uh, that law and economics needs to address, but it is also perhaps the most difficult problem. All right. What I want to what I want to do at this point is contrast um, this dynamic view of the legal system, which I've only sketched in a very abstract way, and I hope to get more concrete as I as I go along. But I want to contrast that uh, with what I call the static view of a legal system. And I, I was surprised to learn that there is actually quite a lot of uh, literature in legal theory uh, embodying this uh, static view. Um, and it bears a very close or very uh, interesting similarity to static views in economics. For example, in the uh, Arrow de Bru uh, general equilibrium theory, uh, other uh, forms of economic analyses in which there are no processes of adjustment. Um, the legal theorists uh, who embody or who advocate uh, the static view of a legal system have said things such as the following, that the addition or substitution of a rule to a legal system has the effect of creating a whole new system. And why? Because every new rule, every norm, affects some other norm or rule within the system. Sounds like the general equilibrium argument, right? You change something somewhere and the whole equilibrium is changed because of some small change anywhere uh, within the system. If that's the case, if that's the way basically you're going to look at it, then the idea of a system uh, which is changing is in a way a sort of contradiction in terms. Uh, and theorists in this tradition, the static tradition, uh, recognize that. Uh, for example, there are two uh, uh, French theorists uh, who have written a book uh, called Normative Systems, uh, Alcheron and Bulgin. Um, Bul These are not obviously French names, but uh, in any event, uh, they conceive in their book as a French law as the sequence of all momentary legal systems that have been enforced in France. So what, what, what kind of talk is that? Well, what is this really saying is, look, the only way we can conceive of, the, of a legal system is to say that it is a snapshot or a series of snapshots of static legal systems. That the legal system itself is not something which changes, but is something which is static, uh, and it just changes with respect to uh, exogenous or autonomous factors in the environment. Perhaps some costs in the, in the economic system change, and that changes uh, the, 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 the context or the, uh, uh, the nature of the legal system. But there's nothing endogenous to the legal system uh, that brings about change. The legal system is not, in this view, an endogenous process of change, but is merely a process of reacting to uh, exogenous changes, changes from without the, outside the system, changes in the economic or political or social framework. What I would like to understand uh, is the law, the legal system, as a, not a collection of elements that responds to exogenous uh, uh, changes, but rather a system which uh, responds to endogenous changes, a system which has at least partial control of its own transformations. 
Now let me go through a, um, a few characteristics so we can get a little more concrete uh, in this area, but uh, I'll warn you, I'm not going to get all that concrete, um, but uh, I want to get somewhat more concrete. Let me go through some areas uh, of concern of, uh, of, to the legal, of the legal system and try to show how in each one of these areas there is a, a, an important uh, endogenous dynamic uh, that the legal system embodies, the common law legal system embodies. Uh, uh, Paul Rubin's talk uh, made me think that maybe I should say the, the pre-New Deal common law legal system, but I'm not sure. Uh, this is an ideal type, uh, so it uh, doesn't necessarily refer to any particular uh, era in, in the common law system but hopefully refers to what is essential in that process. Okay, we often hear it said, and Hayek was one of the people who said it the most, uh, that the common law is based on pre-existing uh, but implicit rules. Now what exactly does that mean, pre-existing rules? Well, one thing it does not mean is that the common law judge has in his office a, a shelf of the pre-existing rules. And as, as cases come, uh, come across his desk, he pulls down from the shelf these rules and, uh, and applies them in particular cases. That's not what Hayek, or what, certainly not what I have in mind. Uh, rather, the point and the, the, the force of the word implicit rules is that these rules are things which come into existence only as the need arises. In other words, as the case comes before the judge, uh, the rule sort of comes into existence at that very moment. What makes it a pre-existing rule is that once it's decided in the way that it's decided, people generally assent. They say, yes, that's sort of consistent with the way we think about these issues. But it's not as if the rule is on the, um, on the shelf and it's simply pulled down, or it's not as if it's an innovation in the Schumpeterian sense, where the actual scientific discoveries are somehow made beforehand, and the innovator just simply pulls them off the shelf and, and applies them in particular contexts. Um, so the first thing to keep in mind is that even at this very basic level of applying um, uh, rules that are pre-existing, there is a dynamic element. And the dynamic element is the following, uh, that the rules have the appearance of being new rules, but have the acceptability of old rules. So what the common law really is doing by drawing on pre-existing rules is once again a balancing, or I shouldn't say balancing, but, in, but, but utilizing both the forces of order and the forces of disorder or surprise or novelty. The novelty, or you might say judicial entrepreneurship, comes into play uh, when the judge uh, applies the pre-existing rules, but he does it in a way which is creative and not obvious to people before, he's before he did it or before the issue arose. On the other hand, there is the sort of mundane or not so novel aspect of this, is that once the rules are announced, they oftentimes uh, are greeted with wide assent, as if people knew them all along. So here, at the very core of the common law method, is a, uh, is a, is a, is a, uh, a, a cooperation, a, a, uh, a complementarity, of the forces of order and the forces of disorder, or the forces of uh, novelty uh, or um, innovation, as you might alternatively want to state it. And now again, at the very uh, basis, base of the common law uh, method, is the abstraction of the kinds of rules that the common law embodies. Now, I, I, uh, I've thought about, you know, is there a nice definition of abstract, abstract I could use? Uh, and I'm not all that confident that I could present a, a formal definition of the, of the idea of abst abstract or abstract rule as opposed to simple rule. Uh, but so let me try to make some progress uh, on, uh, intuitively here with, uh, with an intuitive 
uh, understanding of uh, abstraction. Um, in the common law, uh, people are uh, treated, defendants and uh, plaintiffs are treated in a particular way, not because of their personality or because of their particular station in life, but by virtue of their conduct belonging to a certain class. Right? So that we would have, for example, you take the old uh, Epstinian paradigms of causation, uh, A hit B states a prima facie case uh, for recovery in, in the tort law. Um, but that's to be contrasted with the fact that uh, B did not hit A. A hit B, but B did not hit A. So there's an asymmetry of their relationship. Uh, and the, it's the asymmetry that establishes the uh, grounds for um, the uh, recovery of the plaintiff. Now, this is stated really, in effect, abstractly. It's for any plaintiff and any defendant uh, in, a, in a myriad of circumstances. So we're dealing with classes or types of relationships. Now, this has been important in the common law because it's one of the ways in which the common law can, uh, can demand the um, deference of, uh, of people, the only a way that it can lay claim to authority. Um, if people are treated the same, regardless of their personal and uh, eccentric uh, circumstances, and people can f justify in their own mind treatments of particular plaintiffs or defendants on the grounds that other people in those circumstances would have also been treated in the same way. Okay, now, how does this relate to our point about order? and disorder. Well, the, the point is that abstract rules are rules which are in effect flexible. They allow for lots of changes in the concrete circumstances and yet the rule doesn't fall apart. The rule does, doesn't break. Uh, in effect, uh, the rule is uh, 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 in a very uh, particular sense is decomposable from the changes uh, that occur in the overall day-to-day uh, -day activities of uh, individual actors. So, for example, when we talk about contracts, right, we have an idea of what is required uh, for a valid contract, including, at least on, on uh, the classical theory, uh, the presence of uh, consideration. That's what, what is bargained for in exchange. But we don't have anything in the common law, the classic common law, about what the just price is going to be of a particular a commodity. We don't invalidate the contract because of the particulars, the economic particulars that have to do with the variations of supply and demand. There isn't a different fundamental contract law every time uh, the uh, economic data change. We have a contract law which is in effect a separated or decomposable from the changes in the everyday uh, uh, economic system. Now the significance of this is that the common law then accommodates the, what I will say is the relative disorder relative to the stability of the abstract rules, the relative disorder of the market system. But more than that, that this so-called disorder of the market system is actually something very desirable. Because what is it? It's the ability to change with respect to changing circumstances. Right? So people can adjust uh, to, uh, in accordance with changing economic circumstances. So for example, if I make a contract with somebody specifying a certain future price uh, for wheat, I may do it with the expectation that the contract price say a year from now, is going, to be <clears throat> is going to be cheaper than the spot price a year from now. Hmm. Well, this was not indelible ink. Um, the spot, yeah, the spot price, all right. The spot price uh, uh, a year from now uh, may in fact be higher, may in fact be lower than the contract price. <clears throat> but no matter, I mean, the common law, you, there might be breach, and we can talk about efficient breach and all that, but, but the common law doesn't change 
The contract law doesn't change because of the, that particular adjustment in the market. But more importantly than that, it's because of the very uh, abstractness of the common law uh, that, that these adjustments can in fact take place and they're beneficial adjustments. For example, we could not be continually supplied with the products we want if producers refused or could not change their behavior in light of uh, new circumstances. It might be physically impossible in view of changing resource constraints to continue on as before. And if the law did not permit uh, agents to change their behavior uh, with a certain flexibility, uh, we would not have then the uh, certainty that we, or relative certainty, that we could get uh, the products we want uh, with the reliability that we have grown to expect. And so therefore, paradoxically, the order or certainty embodied in an abstract rule allows for the flexibility, novelty, and adjustment of the economic system, which in my way of looking at this is the disorderly aspect or the, or the unpredictable aspect uh, of the of the, of the common law system or the, or, the, or the unpredictable aspect of the system of common law in conjunction with the system it's designed or we hope will, it will govern. Um, so once again, there is this interplay between order and disorder, uh, between novelty and stability uh, in, the, in the common law. Okay, I want to go on. Um, and Hayek has said a, a lot about this uh, point uh, that uh, we can only assure the um, we can only assure the protection of certain expectations if we allow the frustration of other expectations. Uh, the common law does not, in a rigid sense, ensure everybody's expectations. Right? Just as I was arguing a moment ago, if it did that, it would really have to prevent economic adjustments, which then in, in turn would frustrate the expectations that people have uh, developed for the availability of products and for the uh, adjustment of the economic system when circumstances change. All right. I want to go on now to some other matters, uh, and that has to do with the form that legal reasoning takes, common law, legal, uh, common law reasoning takes. Uh, this is a very interesting area to me because um, there seems to be a conflict or at least a tension between the way economists look at the common law and the way those uh, legal theorists who have written about common law reasoning uh, have looked at the, the common law. It's generally um, thought uh, that uh, the common law method uh, generally thought by legal theorists, that the common law method is not a deductive method. Uh, but it is, is the case that there has been a school of legal theory, uh, which is, I think is very uh, consistent with some of the ways economists have tried to model the common law in a fairly deductive uh, fashion. Uh, there is a tradition of legal theorists who have done really the same thing. Uh, this system goes back at least uh, to uh, the philosopher Leibniz, uh, when he was criticizing uh, some aspects of the Roman law, um, gave what he thought was an improved way of, uh, of, 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 uh, of treating law or a, re a way of reconstructing uh, the legal order. And here he says that uh, what you want to do is reconstruct the order in a geometrical fashion commencing from first truths and drawing from, from these direct consequences, and from consequence to consequence, arrive in the most logical way possible at an axio axiomatic legal system. So this is Leibniz, the Leibnizian uh, tradition has it that we can have a deductive theory of legislation. And this is, um, uh, makes perfect sense in a static world. In a static world, there's no reason why, especially after a long period of, uh, of development, uh, 
a, a law or a legal system could not have a series of premises and then just simply uh, deduce consequences uh, from those, uh, that series of, of premises. Uh, Montesquieu um, took this idea and said, well, we can apply it all, 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 we can apply this idea also to adjudication. Uh, he thought adjudication, judging, was essentially a trivial operation. Why? Well, this is how he looked at it. He said, well, the major premise is, the general, is a general statute of some sort or a general norm. That's the major premise. The minor premise of the practical syllogism is the action confer, conforming or not conforming to the statute. So we have a general statute. That's our major premise. We have some action on the part of some particular individual which either conforms or not to the statute. That's the minor premise. And the conclusion is <coughs> either release the guy or punish him. So it's just a practical syllogism. Doesn't take much of an imagination then to be a judge. Bentham, in his uh, utilitarian approach to the law, viewed law basically as a mechanism or as a calculational uh, device. Once the utilitarian standard is set, right, all we have to worry about is correct calculation. So here again, it's, it's basically uh, taking certain premises and, and calculating correctly uh, the right result. Uh, as many of you know, Bentham uh, uh, placed a uh, high uh, um, emphasis or great emphasis on um, calculational error as really the source of uh, our difficulties, both legally and morally. Uh, our difficulties arise because people are not good calculators. So they should be sent to school, basically, or educated to be good calculators. And once they, they learn to calculate pleasures and pains well, then everything is just a matter of this uh, churning out. Finally, um, there is something uh, which in the early part of this century was called the exegetical school of um, legal interpretation. And here, uh, what they, these people were concerned about was statutory interpretation. And they said that statutory interpretation uh, is basically a uh, deductive enterprise. We don't have to go to the or, you know, this original intent business, so they didn't use that term. We don't have to go to the subjective intent of, the, uh, of those who, uh, fa who fashioned the law, or who created the law, but simply we are to, to simply deduce logically from the statute all of the statutes for all of the conclusions that are implicit in it. And that's statutory interpretation. Uh, even better than that, we can begin from a statute or the legal rules drawn from it, and go back, infer from that the higher principle that, that enables us to rationalize that law, that statute, and then deduce conclusions from that higher principle that might not have been already seen. Now this is very much like, seems to me, uh, the sort of classic Posnerian economic approach to law, right? Uh, that we can take a, uh, a legal rule and we can reach back to that higher principle, efficiency, that informs the legal rule. And then, uh, once we know that's the higher principle, we can deduce all sorts of things for efficiency and then correct the parts of the law that are not right or at least not consistent with efficiency. So we can, we can both have a, uh, a, 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 we can both engage in a positive activity Right? inferring what the rationale is, and also a corrective or normative activity. That's why I believe it was never quite clear whether Posner, more than Landis, for example, Posner was doing normative or positive economics, uh, because there was this, this, this aspect of, well, you know, now that I really understand the common law, I can go in there and correct those areas that happen to get messed up for some random reason. Now, the non-deductive uh, method, which I think is the method of the common law, uh, is based on a, a method uh, known as analogous reasoning. Now, some people, uh, probably most people involved in various academic disciplines, think that uh, analogies are a primitive form of reasoning. Uh, in a sense, that's true. 
But I also think that the analogies are an appropriate form of reasoning when we're dealing with open systems. Uh, and I'm going to, I want to show that by uh, an illustration. Um, but why should we believe, or what, what grounds do we have to believe that the common law is an open system? Well, the grounds that we have to believe the common law is open system is, uh, are two, and they're both were pointed out by H.L.A. Hart. First is that uh, there's a relative indeterminacy or indeterminism of the judge's aims. The judge does not start out with a clear objective function. Now, if Hart's right that the, ju that the judge's objective function uh, is, is not set beforehand, but that his aims are in effect uh, decided in the process of his uh, making decisions, uh, that could account for the difficulty in trying, in the economic and political science literature, of trying to find an uh, objective function for judges and deal with that. Uh, it's, I adm admittedly, this is not a comfortable idea for uh, economists, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's an important idea to consider. Uh, the second uh, source of indeterminacy is the unpredictability of future fact patterns, and this is a limitation of our, of our knowledge. We don't know what future facts are going, to, are going to be, and therefore we can't really predict how a, a rule, or even if we had a rule plus an objective function, will play itself out in particular circumstances. And oftentimes, uh, people find that in particular circumstances, uh, that uh, they don't like the rule. They don't like its implications. And there's a real question in, in, in the area of ethics and also, I guess, in, in the law, is how do you judge a, uh, a legal rule, whether a legal rule is good or bad, desirable or undesirable? Right? Uh, do you judge it by the abstract or general considerations? Or do you judge it by the considerations uh, that come about in a particular application? So if a legal rule leads to a grotesque application, for example, remember there is that famous 19th century case in which the uh, people were strand, uh, stranded on a, uh, 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 a lifeboat and uh, they cannibalized the, uh, yes, right, Dudley versus, uh, uh, Virginia versus Dudley and Stevens. Uh, they cannibalized the, uh, the cabin boy, uh, and what happened was they were uh, convicted of murder, uh, and they were condemned to death, but then the queen uh, commuted the sentence. Right? Do we judge the rules uh, against murder, or the rules against unjustified killing, uh, on the basis of that obnoxious consequence, perhaps obnoxious to some people, consequence, that is to say, the consequence that they were condemned to death under those circumstances where if they didn't do that, all, all of them would have died probably. Uh, well, it's a, it's, a real, it's a really important question. I think empirically, as a matter of fact, people oftentimes, when they come to conclusions which are uh, repellent, uh, step back and modify the generalization. In which case, then, if we don't know the particular fact patterns, we can't predict them in advance, we can't predict what kind of modification is going to take place in the rule, and so once again, there's a kind of uh, uncertainty or indeterminacy uh, in, the, uh, in the legal system arising out of the unpredictability of the future uh, fact patterns. Let me give an example of uh, analogous reasoning. An example which I have given before and elsewhere, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's a, it's a very interesting one, and it has the good, I, can, I consider the good result, that it leads to, it's a spontaneous development uh, based on analogous reasoning that does not lead to a good place. I mean, I, you know, it's easy for me as an Austrian to, to give you examples of uh, spontaneous developments that lead to something good. And that's what you would expect me to do. Uh, but I'll, I'll uh, disappoint your expectations here because I think there are some important uh, 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 issues involved uh, that uh, we can deal with once we understand uh, uh, this, um, this process of analogous reasoning and how it can sometimes go wrong. What I want to talk about is this doctrine of the negligent infliction of uh, mental distress. The history of the doctrine is very interesting. 
uh, because it, it, it can be presented in a way which very clearly shows how analogies or analog analogous reasoning uh, is responsible for the expansion of the doctrine. But the expansion of the doctrine in ways which I think a lot of classical liberals uh, would find to be very uh, unfortunate. Uh, the original rule, or at least the original as far as back as I, I'm willing to go, is what was known as the impact rule. Uh, for mental distress, the negligent, for recovery, for the negligent infliction of mental distress, the original rule had it that there must be a physical impact on the plaintiff, however slight that impact uh, was. So the recovery for physical harm would take place, and then there would be a recovery for consequential mental distress. But if a person was not physically injured, they could not get any recovery uh, for mental distress, uh, negligent infliction of mental distress. Well, people began to think about it in the context of new cases emerging, and it began to appear as new fact patterns emerged uh, that the impact rule uh, might be unjust. Uh, the reason for that was, for example, an individual who had, who was slightly, had a slight impact uh, in terms of, let's say, a car hitting him very slightly, uh, would get damages for mental distress. But a person who narrowly escaped some major catastrophic harm uh, would get nothing. But obviously, the mental distress was much worse in the second case the case that a person narrowly escaped a major catastrophic harm. So, it seemed that uh, the impact rule was a little too narrow. And so what developed there uh, on the basis of this comparison of the uh, previous situation, the previous rule, and uh, uh, new factual situations, which seemed to be more or less in the ballpark of the kinds of things that the impact rule w was designed to remedy, that is to say, designed to remedy a substantial and, uh, uh, um, mental distress that took place in the context of some sort of uh, uh, physical impact, it's not too big a deal, not too big a jump to say, well, it's probably also the case that if, you're, if you narrowly escape a physical harm, that's really the same thing as actually being impacted by some physical object. It's really more or less the same thing. And in fact, it might be even a better case to the extent of the mental distress in escaping uh, uh, worse harms may be, in fact, uh, uh, more intense than the mental distress of suffering slight harms. Okay. Well, again, new fact patterns uh, develop, and the zone rule seemed unduly uh, restrictive. Uh, recoverable mental res distress could only be with re respect to the danger suffered by the individual himself. But now think of a, another situation, distress suffered by witnessing of harm to others. Uh, that was not recoverable, but seemed that uh, unjust in the context of a close family relations. Suppose a mother sees a child run down, killed by, or killed or injured by a, an automobile. The mental distress there would probably be quite intense. It does relate to a physical harm, a physical harm to the child. Uh, it's true, not a physical harm to the mother. But nevertheless, the, the bond, the connection between mother and child is so close Right? as to make it um, the case that, well, maybe we could. And in fact, it seems right that we expand the rule because, just think, suppose you're in the zone of physical danger uh, and you experience a mental distress, the previous rule. Um, your mental distress may not be anywhere near as severe as a mother who sees a child killed. Okay. Well. The point I'm making, and this, this, this evolution could go on, is by a process of analogous reasoning, analogies with the previous situation, uh, the law tends to, can, did in this case, expand its domain, 
change the, the nature of the, of the rule. Uh, the, the changes are incremental. No one intends the final outcome. No one can predict the final outcome. It seems to be a spontaneous development. Yet, I say, that this has not necessarily been a benign or beneficial uh, development in the law. Well, one could view this as the disorderly or novelty uh, aspect of the, of the, of the law, in, in engendering new doctrines that, that could not be predicted. On the other hand, to the extent that the common law judges uh, apprehend or understand that uh, at bottom, or unifying all of their deliberations, is some sort of basic philosophy about individual autonomy. There is a constraint brought in from, the, from, you can say, the outside, or you can say it's another part of the common law, which provides a, a, an order, a predictability, that in fact can regulate this kind of analogous, uh, an analogous reasoning development. So that the common law proceeds by analogous reasoning, uh, but is constrained by a orderly uh, concept of the underlying uh, purposes or underlying philosophy of the common law. Am I running out of time? Okay. Uh, finally, I want to give another example of the interplay, uh, very briefly, between order and disorder in the common law. And that has to do with uh, something which generally people think is a bad thing, ambiguity. You know, should, the, should legal rules be ambiguous? Well, there's a case to be made that legal rules should be ambiguous to the extent that, or at least have some ambiguity, to the extent that the future is unknowable, and to the extent that you'll have to adjust to that unknowable future, you want to protect yourself, in effect, by having a, a rule or a set of rules which are sufficiently flexible to accommodate new situations. So ambiguities or equivocations, redundancies, even some disorders, uh, are really the uh, the basis or the groundwork for innovations or moments of self-organization. Uh, the disorder is really the, uh, the, uh, the, the dim vision of the emergent rationality of, um, of, of adaptation to new circumstances. So it's not in our interest to have a tight, logically airtight, deductive uh, legal system. Because such a system in, the app, in a world of uncertainty uh, is not going to give us the flexibility to adjust uh, to uh, this unknown future. And that's why I think economists have a lot to learn from legal theorists about uh, the virtues of some of the things, some of the aspects of the common law, which heretofore have been considered the sloppiness of the lawyers or the judges, and we economists are going to go in and fix it all up. So there's a kind of defense here of ambiguity and uh, of, uh, of uh, disorder, uh, as well as a defense of the ordering properties of the common law. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I want to congratulate you.